Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is a bit of a serious topic, but it's one that we deserve to have a conversation about. It's the racial wealth gap. And, you know, I confess, I had not heard that term, or if I heard it, I hadn't paid much attention to it until maybe in the last year or so. But tonight we're going to explore what is the racial wealth gap, a little bit about its history, what it looks like, and hopefully we'll wind up thinking about what we can do if not to close the racial wealth gap, keep it from expanding and swallowing up our families and our communities. This webinar is the first in a series of conversations about the racial wealth gap. Our aim is to provide a historical perspective and explore the key policies, programs, institutions that continue to impact racial equity. Wealth is usually defined as the value of one's assets less the value of one's debt or indebtedness. And it serves as a critical component. You know, that's one of the ways we measure financial health is what is your, what's your net worth? And it also helps to measure what economic opportunity looks like. What we see in the United States, and I've, we've got experts who are going to talk to us about it in more detail. When you get racialized, race-based barriers to wealth accumulation, then you're not just measuring money, you're measuring opportunity. And in the United States, those racialized wealth barriers are well documented. You might be surprised to know that the Federal Reserve Bank the Federal Reserve Banks, because they're regional banks all over the country, Atlanta, Cleveland, Minnesota, Minneapolis rather. The Federal Reserve has long studied wealth disparities because equal access to wealth is so important to achieving full employment and an inclusive economy. Barriers to wealth accumulation deny families and communities long-term economic mobility, and financial resiliency. Tonight, we'll take a look at past and present structures and institutions that contribute to persistent wealth disparities. The median wealth gap between black and white families in the United States is significant and unfortunately, still on the rise. Racial inequality in housing, education, jobs, criminal justice system holds back our economy and limits the pursuit and access to the American dream. More than 50 years after the 20th century civil rights movement won passage of now historic civil rights laws like the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65. And some people are surprised to know, you know, there was a Civil Rights Act of 1870. We won't go into that tonight. But more than 50 years after the mid 20th century movement, White families have just about 10 times as much wealth or net worth as black families. The fact that black folk on average have considerably less wealth than whites is troubling, not just because it is an inequality of outcomes, but it also suggests an inequality of opportunity. Economic opportunities provided by wealth includes, and I've experienced them and maybe you have too, surviving a layoff, surviving a pandemic, handling surprise medical expenses. You need a new set of tires, a new refrigerator, the washing machine goes out. And even taking advantage of quality housing and education, all of these can be made worse because of lack of net worth or wealth in the family. You gotta have a little bit, you need a cushion. And that's what we talk about. That's what we mean when we talk about net worth. Our speakers tonight come from different parts of the country. They've had different experiences, but by the end of the evening, I hope you'll see that they have a lot in common. If you're a black person living in the United States, I think you'll find it helpful to understand the racial wealth disparity and how it 
is not just an economic issue, but a social issue, a civic engagement issue. One of our speakers, the first one is the most well-known black economist in the country, I say without fear of contradiction. She is none other than the Dr. Julianne Malvo. Currently, she is Dean of the Department of Ethnic Studies at Cal State University in Los Angeles. She earned a PhD from the prestigious Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She served as the 15th president of Bennett College. She is the author of several books, frequently appears on television. She has her own radio show. She writes a weekly column, Dr. Julianne Malvo. She is also the chair of Push for Excellence, an affiliate of Reverend Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Push Coalition. And she is my sorority in Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. So what I want to do now before I introduce our next speaker is ask Dr. Malvo a sort of a level setting question. How did we get a racial wealth gap to begin with? Dr. Malvo? Okay, can you hear me now? We can, absolutely. Okay. Well, good evening all, good evening NCNW sisters. I have been a life member of NCNW since I was a baby girl. And I uh, love the organization and I'm so proud of my sister Janice Mathis for the work that she's doing. Um, may she continue to lift up black women at a time when we definitely need to be lifted up. Now, the question you asked before, I said, there's one small correction in my introduction. I am the Dean of the College of Ethnic Studies, which has three departments that report to it. There are only two colleges of ethnic studies in these United States, both of course in the state of California, one at San Francisco State University and the other here at Cal State LA. I have, reporting to me are departments of Pan-African Studies, Asian Asian American Studies and Chicano Latino Studies. I also have the charge that I'm really excited about of developing a department of American Indian studies. So uh, we are building, and what I say to my team is that we are doing higher education, not as usual, but unusual. Ethnic studies is about myth busting. And we've been, one of the ways that we must bust myth uh -huh. is to look at the, um, look at this wealth gap and its oh. origins and the other things that we are dealing with in terms of this. I want to go, well, how did we get such a wealth gap? Enslavement was the first reason. We became other people's wealth. Owning black people was how other people basically had their wealth. So that's number one. Uh, at the end of enslavement, black people were so, we were land hungry. We wanted land we, and, and we wanted to do our own thing. We quite frankly, were not thinking about white people. But the end of enslavement marked the downfall of Southern Moors. And they had to take a minute to figure out what to do about it. And when they took that minute, they started attacking us. But dig this, Janice raised the issue that she said the wealth gap right now, whites have about 10 times as much wealth as black folks. In 1880, there was one black dollar for every 36 white dollars. By 1890, that had gone for to $1 for every 26 white dollars. 1900, $1 for every 23 white dollars. 1910, $1 for every 16 white dollars. And then from 1910, 100 years later, it's $1 for every 10 white dollars. So if for, in relative terms, we made more progress between 1880 and 1900 than we have made from 1910 until now. Uh, wh why is that? Well, um, basically Jim Crow laws restricted black mobility, black ac accumulation. There were laws even against us owning certain tools so that we could not compete with white tradespeople, uh, e even though we're quite competent. The only union pre, uh, I'd say pre-1970 that embraced black people really was the mine workers union. Why? Because when you went down in that mine, you, you were dependent on your coworkers, whether they were black or white. Um, and some people will say in jest, you couldn't tell whether they were black or white when they had all that coal dust on them. But in any case, the mine workers were the, among the most welcoming of unions. Uh, many just were not. Uh, we see, we can see from our World War II history with the Rose of the River to history, how black women were excluded actively from uh, unions, even as unions had to bring women in to do welding and others because men had gone to war, 
white women actually boycotted uh, the inclusion of black women because they didn't want to use the same restroom that we were using. And so they did not want black women to be hired. But when Jim Crow laws were passed, this was really about, and it kind of Janice reminds you of today. Black folks had made so much progress. We had stuff. I mean, we were accumulating um, and that accumulation was very threatening to whites. So we have many, many instances of what I call racial economic envy that essentially eroded black people's ability to accumulate. I mean, Ida B. Wells, our, our champion sister, Ida B. Wells, the first, she, she, was, she was the chronicler of lynchings. The first lynching she chronicled was of, of three of her friends who had the nerve, let me roll my neck again, the nerve to open up a grocery store that competed with a white man's store. And so they opened the store because sisters did not want to go to the white man's store. The white man in question had like about a dozen citations for all kinds of violations and selling liquor and talking under women's clothes. And so this brother, Tommy Moss, who was a stellar citizen, a postmaster, a church deacon, he and two of his friends opened a store called the People's Grocery. It was about a block and a half away from the white people's store. Of course, the black people started going to Tommy Moss's store and the white man was mad. So the white man, so what, ha what had happened was two people, two kids really had, had a marble game, a white kid and a black kid. And the black kid was beating the white kid. So the white kid ran to the white folks store and was crying and whining. And the white folks went to the black store trying to do something to a little boy because he won marbles. And the brothers were like, we ain't having that. We are not having that. So gun, shot, but gunfire was exchanged and uh, one of the white men got shot. They didn't kill him. Uh, they shot him. I, never mind. I'm not going to say what I was going to say. Janice Mathis knows me. She knows what I was thinking. In any case, the next day, the sheriffs came and arrested the three black men who owned the store. And the next day they were lynched. This was about economic envy. And the, in, in about a month, the man who owned the white store was able to acquire the black man's store for eight cents on the dollar, economic envy. And there's so many, our, our history is replete with that. There's another um, story of a gentleman in uh, Georgia who had what the, uh, Georgia or Mississippi, he had what they call good cotton land. He had 450 acres of good cotton land. And uh, he was described as quote arrogant, of course. They uh, one of the white women who knew about him said he was very smart, but he was a, um, what did it say? An insolent Negro, insolent, another word they use. So uh, this gentleman went to sell some cotton seed and um, the proprietor of the general store offered him less. He was standing in line behind a white man, offered him less per pound of his cotton seed than he offered the white man. The brother said, I'd rather throw my cotton seed in the damn river. He used the word damn. There was a law against a black person cursing at a white person. It's fun. A law, a law, you could not curse a white person. He cursed the white. He said, I he didn't curse him. He said, I'd rather put my damn cotton in the, in the river than to give it to you at a different price. When he walked out of the store, he was arrested. This brother, the, the, he had, they asked him what his bond was. He said, they said $15. He reached in his pocket and gave him $15 and kept on walking. Uh, he had it like that. They said he owned, he, he lent money to whites as well as blacks. Well, you know, they could not stand that kind of insolence. So the next thing you know, he was lynched. And they hung his body until the crows had basically, they just hung it. They didn't let his family have it. Then two poor, two pieces of poor white trash became the executors of his estate through court machinations. And his family was given 30 days to get out. So all that land, just gone. He had accumulated, he had worked, he had inherited some and worked for some, just gone. There are so many stories like that. That really, um, I just tell you one more because you know I love these stories, just because I, they, they really are illustrative of where of what how we got where we are. In Valdosta, Georgia, there was a white man who, in order to get his crops, he would bail black men out of jail. And then they had to work for him. Um, when he bailed him out, he, there was never a clear deal. Like, you go to work for me for 30 days or 60 days. It's just, you go work for me until I let you stop working for me. Well, a brother, there was a brother who just, he snapped. He was beaten by the white man while he was sick. And so he snapped, he got his uh, long, his rifle and he shot the man. 
He also shot his wife, but he killed the man. He didn't kill his wife. Again, there's something to be said about AIM. Um, but in any case, um, the, so the next two weeks in Valdosta, Georgia, every single day, they lynched a black man who had any connection to the man who did the shooting. They lynched you know, church members, uh, friends, even people who didn't know him. Uh, and this is about economics as well, because this white man was basically getting free labor. Now, a black woman, Mary Turner, went down to the courthouse. She was 19 years old and she was pregnant. She went to the courthouse that, to demand answers. Why did you lynch my husband? Right. And uh, they said that she was mouthy and disrespectful. So they lynched her. But this is how they lynched her. They hung her by her ankles. They poured gasoline on her slip, her, her petticoats. Um, they uh, lit her on fire. And now y'all have to know that many lynchings were accompanied with burning people up, which we don't talk about that a lot because it becomes much more horrible. And as she was, I said she was 19 years old and nine months pregnant. The, all of the trauma to her body caused her to expel her fetus. And then those evil devils stomped her fetus. Again, this was about a black economic envy again. These black people should not have personal agency over their bodies. So we saw that period of post reconstruction, white folks just gone wild. Um, Wilmington, North Carolina, they basically ran the 60 most prominent black men out of town. They, they rounded them up one evening. And it was, this was a coup. It was the elected people, the Republicans, they were the good guys then. The Republicans uh, got with the black people to try to overthrow the Democrats. And in response, the red shirts, this was a pre-Klan, they called themselves the red shirts. They rounded up the 60 most prominent black men, kept them overnight, put them on a train with one-way tickets the next day, and then began to confiscate their property. This is how we end up with a wealth gap. Not to mention Tulsa, Oklahoma. And um, Janice would probably say, I'm telling too many stories. I'm just telling, everybody knows about Black Wall Street. So I don't have to tell you that story. You know that story. We, the only thing I've ever thanked the orange orangutan for, y'all know who the orange orangutan is. Janice Mathis is my dear sister. So I promised her I was not going to cuss on this uh, webinar. Therefore, I will not mention the name of a man who was a cuss word, just called him the orange orangutan. Uh, the, the, the orangutan, what he did for us that was useful is lifted up Tulsa, Oklahoma. When he tried to have some rally there, suddenly all the United States knew more about Tulsa than they ever had before. But that again was about economic envy. The governor of Oklahoma in 1921, when this happened, uh, appointed a commission to find out why did this happen? It was the answer. And this is an official document. Too many N-words had too much money. And the N-word was not Negro. Um, we had movie theater, automobile repair, all kind of stuff. So economic envy, and, and the, basically the, the um, that not casual, systematic taking of our land, especially of our land, is how we ended up in the situation that we're in now. That would not just, we don't have to go all the way back to the, early 20th century, we can look at what the federal government has done in terms of public policy with redlining, with failing before to- you, Before you go there, let me interrupt you. Somebody you know lost the hotel in Tulsa. John Rogers, Ariel Capital, hmm. grandfather, it, John Rogers and Melody Hobson have one of the most um, successful financial firms in the country based in Chicago. They manage investments, retirement investments. John Rogers' family got run out of Tulsa, his grandfather, because he was one of the organizers of mm -hmm. some of the economic activity. They had a hotel that was worth a million dollars in 1920. He had to get on the train and leave Tulsa and never go back. And that's how they got to Chicago. So mm -hmm. this is real and these stories are real. And we like to think of them as being in the distant past but they have reverberations today. I'm gonna to come back to that because it's going on right now in a different form. And that's why I wanted Reverend Denise Freeman to be here with us. This sister is a sister beloved that I have known for decades. We both lived and worked in sort of ex-urban rural Georgia. She in Lincoln County and me in Clark County. And she's a Baptist minister. But you've recently seen her on MSNBC. 
with Rachel Maddow. You've seen her on CNN. She's been written about in the Atlanta Journal Constitution and the Washington Post and the New York Times. Today, I noticed because she had the temerity to say to the folk in her county who run the polling precincts, you will not shut down seven precincts so that there's only one in our county where people can vote. So Denise, I want you to, Reverend Freeman, excuse me. I want you to pick up the story from there and give our audience a sense of, Dr. Malvo told us what we were battling a hundred years ago. Tell us what we're battling today. Basically exactly what Dr. Malvo has explained. She's talking about it. I'm sitting here noting and saying, okay, what's changed? What's still the same? Uh, unfortunately, we're still fighting those same wars, those same um, fights, and it's about power and control. It's and and money and wealth. That's always been, and it always will be the bottom line of the power and control. Um, here with the voting. We have not had any issues or situations and all of a sudden after Senate Bill 202 for the state and then Senate Bill 282 and 283 for our local government to restructure, reorganize our vote of elections board. Out of this some way it was born that the best thing to do for black people and as our county commission chairman stated, he said, oh, if I thought this was voter suppression, I would be the first one against it. <laughs> my thought is, well, baby, if this ain't voter suppression, what, and what, what do you call it? And, and as Dr. Melvo was talking earlier, this is because people don't know the history. This is because people refuse to look at the true facts that, because this is systemic racism. This is not by accident. Uh, closing these seven precincts in Lincoln County, Georgia is not by accident. This is because somebody decided this was the perfect place to do this as a test case for the rest of the country. So let's do it in Lincoln County because they're, they're, they're quiet. They don't have any, so it didn't work and it's not gonna work because we see it for what it is. You talk about education. Back in the day, we talked about tracking children from the schoolhouse to the jailhouse. There was a direct link. Now we're talking about people trying to own property in rural Georgia, Janice. And it's difficult because they go to these same banks, and they can't jump through those hoops that they require them to jump through because the system is already stacked against them. So in Lincoln County with the, with the, with the voting precincts, as you said, we said no. We've turned in our petitions. We're still working to do what we need to do to defeat this. So um, that's what's happening right now in Lincoln County, Georgia. What gave you the idea to gather petition signatures? Is there, what's, what's the magic in the petition? Well, according to Georgia state law 2-21-265B, it states that if we get 20%, and I'm just paraphrasing, if we get 20%, then that would basically stop uh, the closing of those precincts. So. Uh, our partners, we partnered with Georgia Coalition of the People's Agenda, who um, brought the petition part to us through the attorneys, and, and uh, we all put that into our strategy, and so that's what we've done. We turned those in last Wednesday. Uh, we're still doing what we need to do to uh, add to those, so to speak. So, you know, it's it's an awesome process and it does work. It's been hard, 
<laughs> but nothing, as you said earlier, is impossible. And that's the hurdle that we have to cross in our head is that nothing's impossible. It may look like it is, it may seem like it, but when we come together, there's nothing that we can't do together. And when I say together, I'm talking about like-minded people uh, of all hues, because that's how it's been throughout the civil rights legacy. It's been all people coming together with the same mindset and mentality to accomplish what it is that they set forward to accomplish. And that's what's been happening here in Lincoln County. So, so the law says if you can get 10% signatures 20. of 10, 20% of the registered voters in that county, they can't close those precincts over your objection. Right. So you gathered those signatures and you're saying that there were black folk weren't scared to sign the petition. Black nor white Republicans even. So there, you know, we live in a county that is for me, I'll use me, for example, I live 20 plus miles away from the city of Lincoln. I live eight, less than eight miles from the place I currently vote. So a lot of our people, there's no jobs in Lincoln. There's no economics for people to survive here. So people work in Athens. People work in South Carolina. People work in Augusta, Georgia, wherever uh, they can find employment, whether they're nurses, doctors, uh, housekeepers, teachers, et cetera, whatever. So they have to travel. And they're traveling one to two hours one way. So they can make it to their local precinct in their community, but to tack on an additional 15 or 16 miles makes it impossible for them to make it to that. Now, why would the commissioners and the Lincoln County Board of Election want that? So that they can disenfranchise people. The more people you disenfranchise, the more power and control you obtain. This is not about uh, saving money. This is not about um, making it better for its citizens. They came up with, oh, ADA accessibility. Half of our, over half of our precincts are in churches. They're all ADA accessible. Only two of our precincts are not in churches. And one of them is mine that I've been voting in for 36 years. We have people in our district that are ADA and they need the accessibility. I mean, that are disabled and they're accessible and they've been voting there for years. So when you want to make people believe that you're doing something for their best interest, you tell whatever lie you think people will believe to sell your bill of rocks. And that's exactly what's been happening. And people have, and, and I say we're the test case for the rest of the world, because if you look in history, they always start their little stuff in a little unknown place where they think they can get away with it and nobody's going to pay attention to, but, but God, let me tell you, this was, but God said, no, I'm going to shed some light on this. And this is how it became national, international, whatever you want to call it, because it needed the light. So people could see exactly what these unethical people are trying to do. My thing is we're not going to shrink. We're not going backwards. We're going forward. And we thank God almighty that people across the country and world have seen this and they're thinking, hey, maybe there's something to it. Maybe this is correct. And Dr. Melvo, they're going back historically and looking at it and saying, oh yeah, this is how uh, systemic racism has gotten to where it is today. So maybe there are some, some long uh, facts to this. So I'm glad I'm on here with you tonight. And uh, so you can clear up all of that for people who may have some disbelief. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think I might be, no, I'm not muted. Thank you so much, Reverend Freeman. We're going to come back to you in just a minute. Now, Dr. Malvo, having heard that, a rural county. Is there any Uber in Lincoln County? 
<laughs> no Uber, no taxi, no no public transportation at all. Um, you know, we have about 27, according to which stats you look at, some say 25, but the other says 27% at poverty level. Um, we have inadequate housing. We have situations and problems with environment. You know, we have educational issues. We have less than 20 black teachers in our school system. And okay. that's from five through 12. You know, every time I was, I'm a former school board member. Every time we had black teachers to apply, they weren't highly qualified. These same black teachers are working in surrounding counties. They were qualified. They just didn't want black folks working teach. <laughs> mm. It's called racism. And, and so the more that they can make black children feel inadequate and insignificant, the more they can control them. So and how they feel about themselves. It's called psychological war warfare. And they've been waging that with our children for far too long. And, and those are things that we've got to really pay attention to, really yeah. paying attention. If a black child gets in a fight at school, they don't call the parents or send them to counseling. They call the police. You know, Jen, but that's a real connection between what Reverend, what the good Reverend is saying and the whole issue of the wealth gap and economic disparities, because there are no rights without voting rights. We don't have rights if we don't have voting rights. And all of these shenanigans around the vote, and we've seen them all over the country. You know, Dr. Cole, our, our fearless leader at NCNW, was among the sisters who were arrested attempting to uh, pressure the Congress, the Senate really, into dealing with voting rights. And we see that thanks to Manchin and Cinema, voting rights just bit the dust. But um, what, here's what we know about voting rights, is the right legislators, when we look at people uh, like a um, Maxine Waters, who is a street fighter for, for justice, do we look at people like um, Cori Bush, one of our most recent members of Congress, who slept on the streets the steps of the Capitol to support the homeless. These are all issues, people are dealing with economic issues, but you can't vote in a new minimum wage. You know, the federal minimum wage has been $7.25 for the past 11 years, $7.25. And then a disproportionate number of the people who get that $7.25 are guess who? Black women and other women of color. So there are no rights without voting rights. And so when people are standing in the gap, to make sure that people have the opportunity to vote, they're also indirectly standing up for economic rights. Uh, we can see what racism has done in terms of federal public policy that has affected the wealth gap. And we know who has stood in um, basically in the way of economic rights being um, exercised. We know that the Southerners, uh, Southern senators, Really, um, they have anti-union laws in many states, so people cannot organize. We know that these are the folks who will not stand up for a federal, uh, mid larger federal minimum wage. Now, in fairness, probably 25 states have a higher minimum wage than the federal wage, but that's not the point. I mean, the point is that, you know, basically people are working for next to nothing. We have people like Reverend William Barber who are connecting the dots between voting, economics, and other things. What we know is that we live in a predatory capitalist country, a predatory capitalist society that wants to extract surplus value from workers. We've seen, product, we, we've seen productivity go up. We have seen um, corporate profits go up, but we have not seen wages go up. Amen. How is it that? And Dr. King once said, you know, all these people keep talking about socialism. Uh, all these, uh, you know, these capitalists, they keep talking about, oh, uh, the Democrats want socialism. What Dr. King said is, these members of Congress, he was talking in 1968, he said they want socialism for the people at the top and rugged individualism for people at the bottom. In other words, anytime your tax system gives my poor people money, 
to your rich people money, that's a reverse form of socialism. And so that's what they say they don't like socialism, but they do. When you see the um, ways that economic recovery has had uneven um, implications so that in the last recession, the Obama recession, as we began to recover from it, the people at the bottom gained very little, but the people at the top actually gained 125% of what they lost. I mean, 125%. It means they lost, they, they broke even, and then they went further while the people at the bottom did not have much. So federal public policy, we can look at the Fair Housing Act. I mean, we can look at any number of acts. The arguments today about affirmative action, the Supreme Court will hear about affirmative action. That's really about money too, because higher education has been the bridge that many people, especially black women, had to cross in order to get out of menial work, um, maids work, pub, private household work, all that. That, you know, in 1940, 70% of all black women were maids. 70% of us were maids. And affirmative action is one of the ways that we were able to get into more professional jobs, get into prestigious colleges, et cetera. Now you have these people say they don't want affirmative action anymore. In fact, these devils have been attacking the, the Biden promise that there will be a black woman on the Supreme Court because they say, well, gee, this is racism. Well, it was never racism when the only qualification to be uh, basically a Supreme Court justice, if you're Brett Kavanaugh, is to be a beer swollen white man. Um, just, you know, the more beer you can drink, the more qualified you are to be on the Supreme Court. But I, I don't want, I'm going the way, I do go on from time to time, but I just want to make sure that we understand that federal public policy is one of the ways that the wealth gap exists, is one of the ways that it has expanded because we basically have advantage black people, white people rather over black people. There's a book by a man named Ira Katz Nelson. It's called When Affirmative Action Was White. And what he talks about is how white people in, at the end of World War II got so many federal benefits because they were veterans, but black men, especially men, but also black women did not get those same benefits. In the state of Mississippi, there were fewer than 700 people who were able to go to college on the GI Bill because they had to go through their county boards. And when a brother said, I wanna go to, um, let's say college, they would say, well, we can, we can pay for you to go to barber school. You know, in other words, they don't want you to have aspirations. And, and so again, connecting my work to that of Reverend Freeman, we have to have voting rights so that we can have economic rights. You don't have any rights if you don't have voting rights. And I, I, I mean, I will chastise our people at, for staying home in 2016, which basically uh, gave us the orange orangutan and his minions and Frank and three Supreme Court justices who mean us no good, who mean us absolutely no good. Let me, let me throw out a statistic and see how you respond to this, either of you or both of you. From 1962 to 2016, even though black people are making more money now than they made in 1962, and white people are making more money than they made in 1962, the wealth gap has remained constant from 1962 to 2016. And it seems to me, if I can shave a few points, if you've got your full right to vote, you might vote for somebody, some politician who will raise the minimum wage. If you've got the right to vote, you might vote for a politician who won't try to outlaw unions. If you've got the right to vote, you might vote for a politician who will equally fund the public schools in your county. Voting power is economic power properly used. And I, I'm not a panelist, I don't, but I, this stuff is so important. Well, you know, Janice, you really, you hit the nail on it, especially when you talk about unions, because if a, a black woman in a union is going to earn 25% more than a black woman who's not in a union doing the exact same work, a black man in a union is going to earn about 33% more than a black man who's not in a union doing the exact same work. Unions are one of the ways that we improve our economic status. But what we noticed, there was just a report out last week that said that the level of unionization in this United States has dropped to about 11%. Uh, there was a and time- let's be clear, there are politicians in this country who have 
intentionally targeted unions and union organizing. The part of the country that we live in, you got BMW, Mercedes, Toyota, Nissan. What are they running from to come to the South? They're running from the United Auto Workers in Detroit. Mm -hmm. There you go. There you go. And so it's really important when we think about this and think about the attacks on unions. I mean, they did not start with the with the orange orangutan. They basically they began with, a, frankly, President Reagan. I mean, people often think of him as this benign, grandfatherly like figure. Um, go back and look. He basically triggered the deregulation the deunionization that we've seen in this country, once upon a time, union membership was as high as about 38%. Now it's down to, as I said, about 11%. The report that came out from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, I guess last week, uh, was it last week or this week? Maybe it was this last week. Anyway, the, the report that came out said that um, we lost union members between 2020 and 2021. That's not so much of a tragedy because it just went back down to the level it was at 2019. But the fact that union membership is so low, and again, you know, it's because we, for people on the left, people, we don't tell our story, we don't tell the truth. So if you talk to a lot of people, they have views about being anti union, and they don't know anything about it. It's just like, I, I, I you know, I'm not going to waste pity on poor brother Biden. But he gave a speech today and he talked about the economic status and how we have a GDP growth that says 6, uh, 6%, roughly 6%, 5.7% in the last year. This is higher than any GDP growth we've seen since 1984. But he doesn't know how to tell the story. So he's babbling all over the place. That ought to be the headline. And you know, whoever is working in his PR office, I mean, I'm sure they're good people, but they need to do better. We don't tell the story. And, the, you know, so right now we're sitting in a crisis of truth, of, you know, really a war between truth and a lie. When people would like to take, they call it uh, critical race theory. Critical race theory is not taught K through 12. Critical race theory is taught in law school. But inclusive edu education, inclusive education must be taught. Young people must know about Tulsa. They must know about Wilmington, North Carolina. They must know about the impact of the Fair Housing Act on our people. And Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oklahoma passed a law that said, you can't teach anything that makes anybody feel bad. Well, mm. my response is, how do you think them people who got burned out felt? I mean, if you just you feel bad, what? how do their descendants feel? Florida let's just get, passed Let's something. get Reverend Freeman back in this. I got a question for her. You ran into an obstacle. When you turned in those 600 signatures, you thought you had enough to stop them. What happened after that and what did you do as a response? Uh, after we turned them in, uh, it took them four days to get them certified and, and the results back to us. And uh, we lost over 120 of our signatures according to the election superintendent but what For we good did reasons is, or bogus reasons uh, they crazy reasons they, <laughs> hmm. you know some she says simply uh we had people who were 80 90 years old who were signing and filling out and she said i can't read the writing these people have been signing this all the time you know who they are so what you you know, just, just silly stuff like that. When you have someone who is part of the situation of disenfranchising or causing harm to their own community because they want to be uh, well-liked or well-deserved, uh, 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 intended by the other persuasion, to me, that's going back through history as being something that I can't say on this show, but we still have people who are like that today. And that's unfortunate. But what we're doing is saying, okay, you threw us a curveball. We were going for just a few precincts. Now we're going for the whole enchilada. We're going to work this weekend through Sunday and do what we do best. And that's 
come back with the results that we need to to make sure every citizen in this county continues to vote in their community. So not one of us, no, not one of us in this community will be disenfranchised um, and our votes will count. And then our second thing is we're gonna make sure that everybody gets registered who are turning 17 and a half and et cetera. We're, this has, energize so many people in this community we they're calling and they're ready to do what's necessary this is the strategy this is the plan when we work together there is nothing that we can't do when we come together across state lines there's nothing that we can't do when we sit and talk and at the feet of people like uh dr melvo right now getting empowered, getting regenerated, getting educated again and again on our history and our legacy. This is what make us better. This is what make us greater because the more we know, the more we can share, then the better we will become and things will change. And this is what the ancestors did. This is why they told the stories. This is why, uh, they thought it not robbery to sit us down and say, you know, right here in Lincoln, Georgia, there were four black men burned at the stakes because a white female said that they peeped in her window and they burned them at the stakes right here in this county. Let this us, um, we've only got about 11 minutes left and I wanna get a, at least a couple of audience questions and I want to throw this out. If there was a guaranteed minimum income, universal pre-K, high quality public education, access to reliable and affordable broadband, two free years of post-secondary education, increase the minimum wage to a living wage, reform education finance and forgive student loan debt, enforce EEOC and civil rights laws and career counseling in high school. You think any of that might help ameliorate some of this racial wealth gap. And if you've got a question, put it in the chat. And we wanna take a couple of questions before we get out of here at about nine o'clock. But Dr. Malvo, with some of these policies or others that you know of, a negative income tax, child tax credit, uh, expanding Medicaid, with some of these kind of political policies make a difference in the wealth gap? Oh, absolutely, Janice. I think that, you know, first of all, in focusing on education, you talked about two free years of post-secondary. The other thing we have to talk about is the forgiveness of student loan debt. African-American women are more likely than any other group to have student loan debt, and we're ha we have more per capita than any other group. So we, Pre President Biden said he was going to forgive some student loans. He hasn't done it. Um, anything connected to education increases somebody's ability to earn a living. And when you increase their ability to learn a living, you increase their ability to accumulate wealth. So everything that you've mentioned, uh, basically the broadband issue is huge. We see it every day. Here on my campus, I live, uh, our, the campus I am on is contiguous to East LA, heavily Hispanic area, but also a heavily poor area. So when I come to, um, I went to my office on Monday, there were young people sitting in the benches outside the office because they had to get internet access on campus because they didn't necessarily have it at home. Or as one lady was saying to me, um, she had three siblings and she said they all couldn't get on the internet at the same time. The other two are in high school, she's in college. So she just comes to campus to use the internet because we're remote uh, this uh, for, until February 14th. So all those things are ways to, when you increase access and income earning ability, we're basically attempting to close the wealth gap. And if not close the wealth gap, at least increase the income stream. Then be, Americans are very ignorant about how much people earn. So a professor at Wharton asked young people, what do you think the median income is? And they came back with six figures. One of them even says, $800,000. I said, okay, that means your daddy rich. Uh, but, you know, but meanwhile, the average income, the median income for everybody in the United States is 67,000. For black people, 45,000. 
we consistently have a median income of about two thirds of that. So we talk about the wealth gap. Many of us can't save. Many black folks can't save because they're basically doing the best they can just to live. And then when we look at our families, uh, many of us who do have reasonable incomes also have Pookie in them. So, uh, you know, Pookie and them always want something. And I, I love Pookie, I love them, I have relatives like that. But you know, if you, you if they think you have got it going on, you know, I have one cousin said, well, can you just pay my phone bill for the next three months? I'm like, excuse me? Um, but that, that, that is- a, But the studies that. show that black people do help out family. Absolutely. And that one of the reasons that the wealth gap remains is that we are, we feel obligated to help family. Had a young man call me yesterday, need $5,000 to go back to school. I ain't got $5,000, but then there's something, his dad is in jail, mama's got a minimum wage job. Somebody needs to help him if he's got the ambition and the desire to go to school. So he should be able to go to school for free. I'm going to stop yeah. talking because I do want to hear from our, our audience. I do too. Uh, the, we have a question that is financial literacy important for black women? Yeah, financial literacy is important, but a living wage is too. Financial literacy is important, but financial, li financial literacy is not a substitute for good public policy. So yeah, you, you need to do better with your money. We all do. We need to learn more about how to manage our money. But if you look at Black folks and Black women in particular, we are inside our production possibility curve. In other words, we're not using our resources as well as we should, but we don't have fair access to resources. And I must, okay. I cannot do and say anything else without saying, using the word reparations. Now, we're not going to talk about it much or long, but look up HR 40. Um, I am on the National African American Reparations Commission. Look up HR 40, go on IBW21.org, put in reparations to learn more about the systematic ways we've been damaged. It's not just money, it's all kinds of things. As the good Reverend said earlier, all you have to do is brainwash somebody. Um, you know, you don't have to, Carter G. Wilson, you don't have to uh, tell someone to go to the back door. If you have so brainwashed them, they go there automatically. Some black folks have been so brainwashed. If there's no back door, they'll make them one. Uh, they will create a back door. So just reparations now. That's all I say, reparations now. Here's a question. Maddie Stevens, I hope it's our Maddie Stevens from Mississippi, says, how can we enforce the prevention of redlining of banks for real estate loans to blacks? Housing ownership creates wealth. Great point. And you know what? Uh, while 70% of white people own their homes, uh, less than 45% of black folks do, and our home ownership has gone down. Part of this has to do with unfair lending policies, as you say, uh, redlining. Part There are so many reasons why basically black home ownership has gone down. And for most middle class people, their home is their primary asset. There is legislation. I mean, one of the good things that President Obama did was establish a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which was Elizabeth Warren's idea. But under the orangutan, basically that bureau was weakened. I think President Biden is building it back up. But the whole issue of access to capital, access to loans, fair treatment in, in the lending process is very important and it doesn't often happen. Uh, can you share the reparations website, please? That's from I, Debbie Wood, Woodburn or Woodbury. Okay, I, the, NARC, the National African American Reparations Commission is a project of the, I, the Institute for the Black World. The website is ibw21.org. And inside that website, you'll find, you can either search for reparations or there's a tab that says reparations, ibw21.org. Uh, Candy says, yeah, my pencil broke so much knowledge being given. <laughs> we love you too. This is a series. We'll be back every, I don't know, four or five weeks, as much as you all want to hear about this, because there's a lot more that we could tell. Uh, it is, uh, uh, Hattie Fleming wants to know, how has the pandemic impacted our wealth gap? It has, it has increased it. Um, yes. There are many people who gained from the, from the pandemic. African-American people did not tend to be among them. Uh, basically, you have corporations who 
manufacturing these N95 masks, doing all kinds of other things. You have people who have benefited from the economic distress that others are experiencing. Uh, we, we we have lost wealth during the pandemic. In addition, uh, we are more likely to have gotten COVID. Um, too many Black women work in those jobs, nurses, um, nurses aides, others, where um, they've been more vulnerable. And uh, while folks like Janice Mathis and I can work from home or wherever else, we're professionals, we're, I'm a dean, I'm a college dean, she leads in CNW, the sister who has to go to work every day she is going through a lot of changes. And we know that the anti-Blackness in this country has an impact on who gets COVID and who doesn't. Remember the brother in Detroit that the woman who refused to wear a mask and she spat on him and he ended up dying from COVID. So we, COVID has really affected the Black economic standing more than we would have expected. Here's a comment, um, Ms. Uh, LaShonda says, in the future, can there be a session specifically about reparations and the racial wealth gap? She's with the NCNW Bethune Leonard section in North Charleston, South Carolina. We might be able to arrange that. I would be more than delighted to help you find the panelists and everything else. We, we might end up getting uh, the good congresswoman from California, or, or no, it's Sheila Jackson Lee in it from Texas. Sheila Jackson Lee has taken much of the lead on H.R. 40. H.R. 40, just a little bit, bit of background, John Conyers introduced it in 1989. And uh, when he introduced it, it had fewer than 40 co-sponsors. Today, it has almost 200 co-sponsors. Now, the likelihood of it getting to the floor, Pelosi has not been particularly supportive. And even if it did get congressional passage, which I hope it does, um, th that crazy Senate is not likely to pass it. But HR 40 is important. And um, yeah, I'd be delighted to work with folks on, on that. We've got, there's a young sister, one child to Google her. Her name is Robin Rue Simmons. Robin Rue, R-U-E, Simmons. She was a city councilor in um, Alderman, rather, in Evanston, Illinois. And what she's done is um, Evanston, Illinois is the first city that has actually done local reparations. Now, it's not comprehensive, but what they're doing is using the money from the weed tax, taxing marijuana. They're using that to attempt to redistribute wealth to people who were cut out of housing opportunities between 19, I think it's like 1920, and 1969. And Evanston had some serious red lighting practices, et cetera. So Google Robin Ruth Simmons. She's one of our, she's sister is not yet 50, and she's one of our rising rock stars in terms of reparations issues. Uh, will future webinars address how many Black folk are losing family owned land? Yeah, that's what you want. That's what we'll do. We'll figure it out. Uh, thank you all for such an informative and insightful webinar. I learned so much. During this event, very excited to tune in to following webinars regarding the racial wealth disparities. This is mind blowing. Gwendolyn White, Michaela Riley say. So I want to thank our panelists, Reverend Denise Freeman from Lincolnton, Georgia. You all watch her on MSNBC. Remember that you met her here first. And my good friend over long standing, Dr. Julianne Malvo, who I look up to. Reverend Freeman and I go way back to the pre-King Holiday days when we would march in downtown Athens for the King Holiday and I'd get marked absent from law school because I felt mm -hmm. like the King Holiday was more important than going to class that day. Of course, they would call on me the next day, but that's a different story. Um, I see Sarah Dennis is here. Thank you all so much. There were more than 100 of us in this um, program tonight want to thank Coca-Cola and the Wells Fargo uh, company for sponsoring this series of webinars and tell your friends and neighbors about it and send us suggestions. I'm Janice L. Mathis at ncnw.org. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, you name it, you can find me. Pretty easy, Janice L. Mathis. Any closing thoughts, Reverend Freeman, before we have to adjourn? Uh Janice, thank Ms. Mathis, thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, anytime you need us, let us know. And uh, to all the folks out there, thank you all for being a part. Dr. Malvo, you get the last word. You know, I love the last word. I want to uh, thank my colleague, my sister, my new friend, uh, Reverend Freeman. Uh, 
profound admiration for your work. Um, folks, I, I know that I'm preaching to the choir when I'm talking to NCNW women about voting, but it's not just about voting, it's about taking people with you to vote. It's about paying attention to these petitions. There are no rights, no economic rights, no rights without voting rights. We got to roll up our sleeves. We got an election coming up. Uh, the the uh, certain people are salivating about the mouth about the possibility of the Republicans taking back the Congress. We cannot let that happen. Thank you all. Good night and blessings and peace and power to each and every one of you. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all.